Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. This is such a special session that we have right now. Thank you all so much for joining us. A special welcome to the BC CEO Club. Thank you, Warren Zola. My name is Linda Henry. I'm the managing director of the Boston Globe and the co-founder of Hub Week. Thank you. Welcome to day four of Hub Week. It has been an incredible week so far. We have been discussing, dancing, exploring, sharing, tasting, and hearing the amazing collision of art, science, and technology happening here. This dive into the future that we are collectively building is continuing here today with two remarkable, forward-thinking, global business and civic leaders sharing a public stage together for the first time here at Hub Week. Michael Bloomberg is joining us. He holds many titles, um, but the top few are founder of Bloomberg LP, as well as Bloomberg Philanthropies, the United Nations Secretary General's Special Envoy for Cities and Climate Change. He is a three-term mayor of New York City, the World Health Organization Global Ambassador for Non-Communicable Diseases, and much more. Michael, has founded a financial data, Michael founded a financial data startup in 1981 and built it into a global business. In 2001, he was elected mayor of New York City and served for three terms before returning to lead his company. Since leaving City Hall, he has resumed leadership of, of Bloomberg. Meanwhile, his incredible foundation focuses on public health, education, the environment, government innovation, and the arts. Recently, his foundation supported the Museum of Science here in Boston and Harvard University. In 2014, Bloomberg was appointed to be the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for Cities and Climate Change. And in 2016, he was appointed to the WHO Global Ambassador for Non-Communicable Diseases. In addition to all of that, he found time to co-author a book with Carl Pope a Climate of Hope. Mike today is going to be interviewed by Abby Johnson. Abby is Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of FMR LLC, which is the parent company of Fidelity Investments, a multinational financial services corporation based right here in Boston. Fidelity makes financial expertise broadly accessible to 26 million customers, from people investing their life savings to businesses managing their employee benefits, to advisors investing their clients' money. In this capacity, Abby is ex responsible for executive management of all of the firm's financial services and diversified businesses, as well as its corporate functions from asset management, retail and institutional brokers, to brokerage to retirement and benefit services, to corporate operations and support functions. She was named to the role of president in 2013 and assumed chief executive duties in 2014. I grew up in a family business, and early in my career, I remember distinctly my dad cutting out articles from the Boston Globe about Abby to inspire me, how she started her career as an equity research analyst and worked her way through the company, learning how everything worked, taking red-eye flights around the, company, around the country, becoming a globally respected business leader for her intelligence, her broad curiosity, and steady leadership of this top financial institution. It is such an honor for me to have Abby join us at Hub Week, not only because she was always a professional inspiration for me, but because she has also become a generous and caring friend. Abby is going to be leading the conversation today with Mike Bloomberg. So they are both born in this area, which make them original Red Sox fans. Mike's moved elsewhere, so we'll see where, where he is. Um, they share a passion for building the future of philanthropy, the future of cities, and the future of technology. Please welcome Abby and Michael. Linda, Linda, thank you for the invitation uh, to join Hub Week here today. It's uh, it's an honor to be a part of this event, and. Uh, Mike, it's great to see you again. Thank you for having me. Good morning, everyone. Oh. So, Mike, let's, 
Let's start from the early days. You were born here in Boston. You grew up in Medford. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that was like and how it helped shape the person that you are today? St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Brighton, lived in Brookline till I was four, and in 1946 moved to Medford. And all I remember the first day is the kid up the street hit me over head with a rock and I came in with bleeding, but he turned out to be my best friend. <laughs> Graduated Medford High School 1960 um, and went to Johns Hopkins. But Medford is a nice town. It's a, 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 a diverse town. Um, it's a working class town, at least it was, I assume still is. And I've always said if I screw it up, it's not going to be because of the schools or my parents. It was fine. So you were a three-term mayor of New York. And working with cities is an important theme of your foundation. Can you talk to us about how cities can innovate and how we can help cities succeed in shaping the future? Well, half the people in the world live in cities, and it's going to be 70% in a few decades. So cities are where the problems are, and cities are where the solutions are. And if you want to have a great job, become a mayor. It is a better job than being governor or president, because mayors actually deliver services, and the public can get to them, and the press can follow them. They're held responsible in a ways that legislators or state or federal government people are not. Um, and you can really do something. And if you want to be a mayor, pick New York because it's the city where you have a police department equal to the size of the sixth largest army in the world. You have a budget bigger than the GNP of half the countries. You have more embassies in New York City than any other city in the world, including Washington because of the United Nations. And you have a like, school system, to put in perspective, a million and a quarter kids. There's 8.4 million people, and they vary from phenomenally wealthy to reasonably poor. Our poor, it, it, it's uh, the, the bottom 20% certainly needs an awful lot of help, but when you look at the poor, you know, they, most people that are poor still have a cell phone and a television, and a big percentage have air conditioning and automobiles. So our poor are not people that are worried about whether they're going to have a meal tonight, they're worried about whether they have a future, whether their kids can get a decent education, uh, whether or not they uh, uh, will have, be able to come home and say, I'm responsible for taking care of my family. Aspirations that everybody has. And we've done a lot to help the bottom 20%, but they still have an enormous number of problems. And in the end, and it's true, I think, for every city, uh, education for the poor is where we've all fallen down, and education for the poor is the only chance they have to move up the economic ladder. And shame on us, we just, and I'll give you a thought, if you want to fix the school systems, and just think about what would happen if you did this, you should pass a federal law saying you can't homeschool your kids, you can't send your kids to private school, you can't send your kids to religious schools, all kids have to go to public schools and then assign all the kids randomly through the school system. You will fix the school system within one month. You really will. Mike, your foundation has also worked with mayors, groups of mayors around some specific uh, futuristic kind of uh, endeavors for cities like how would cities be prepared for autonomous cars? How would uh, cities bring in new technology to help address problems with air pollution? What are, what's the role of public-private partnerships, and how can we all be a part of this? Well, I think you've got to realize the skills to get elected are not necessarily the skills to govern. Every once in a while, somebody will be able to govern, but they don't have the first set of skills, they don't get there. And so what uh, one of the six areas uh, my foundation works on is efficiency in government. It's focused on city levels because obviously I have some expertise or credibility there. 
and we run competitions around the country and we do it all around the world and we have programs where we help we pay for people who will help in innovation and assign them to different cities and we have a nonprofit consulting firm in the foundation made up of commissioners of New York City uh, agencies so they really have some expertise but one of the things that we did recently is and we committed 60 million dollars over 3 years to train 40 mayors a year uh, 10 from outside the United States, 30 inside the United States, and we're doing it jointly with Harvard uh, Kennedy School of Government and the Harvard Business School. Uh, and when we arranged the program, they thought it would be the Harvard Bloomberg program, but that didn't sell very well. So it's, <laughs> anyways, it's in, in New York, not in Cambridge. But the Bloomberg Harvard program to train mayors um, really does give them the first exposure a lot of them have to what's a balance sheet, what's an income statement, how do you negotiate, what contract law is, those kinds of things which the executive of a city has to know about, but generally they come in and they learn on the job, which is painful, and a lot of them aren't in office long enough to ever really master the skills, and so we're trying to pick cities where you have young mayors who are likely to stay in office for a while, because otherwise you're wasting your time in training them, who are interested in learning and accepting new ideas and popular enough that they're likely to get reelected and withstand pressure when they make controversial decisions. And we have them in for, I think it's four days, and we have some professors from the B School and the K School with the case method training them. And it's the first time they've ever been exposed to something like that. And the fact that Harvard's there is, you know, the be all and end all. It's still the magic name in education when they go home. And then three or four weeks later, they send their number two for three or four days, and we do the same thing. So that then they have somebody else in their administration they can bounce ideas off of, and somebody can say, wait a second, that wasn't what the professor said we should do. Uh, and then we have a hotline, and, and I think it's going to be very successful because the problems of today are all problems that are in the city, whether it's crime or education or the environment. All of these things are city problems, and cities are where you can make a difference. And a good example would be climate change, where the federal government under Trump certainly no, and even under Obama, didn't do many, uh, very much. And I don't think Trump's going to do that much damage because you can't go less than zero. And that's what the federal government did. State government's basically the same thing. But in the cities, that's where people got together. They painted their roofs white. They switched to uh, LEDs from incandescent bulbs. They bought more fuel-efficient cars. Uh, they did a lot of things that help them reduce energy consumption, help them store water so the runoff isn't too bad, and all of that sort of stuff. And then the private sector was what really made a difference in America in climate fighting over the last few years because companies today have to be environmentally friendly if they're going to attract the best and the brightest out of schools. Kids want that. Uh, custom, uh, companies, their employees are demanding that they're environmentally friendly. Their stockholders are demanding that. You know, Fidelity's, um, the beneficiaries of the monies you run, they want their monies to be invested socially responsibly. And so who you invest in, get the, the com those companies have an interest in, in helping along. And what's happened in the last uh, five years or so, we have closed half of all the coal-fired power plants in the country and brought down greenhouse gases by 18% across this country. America is going to make its Paris Agreement goals with no help from the federal government whatsoever. And it's all the private sector and local government. Well, one of your famous things that you said, uh, I think mostly as a manager that I always really related to was, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So with regard to innovation, what do you think are the most important things for cities to be measuring right now? We always say, uh, in God we trust, everybody else has to bring data. And uh, you, you, you gotta understand how government works. Most of government depends on votes from people who care more about getting reelected than doing a good job. Now, I don't wanna overstate that, 
But it's really hard to argue that most elected officials don't care very much about getting reelected and aren't influenced by what the public wants rather than what's necessarily, in their view, best for the public. You could see that at a national level. Um, the candidates were pulled to both the left and the right because, not because they thought that was the right thing. In fact, they'd been on the other sides before in their previous careers, but when the, the ability to get elected depend on you um, being uh, having a certain political position, they went right away in those directions. So government doesn't always try to work to do the right thing. In fact, it's fairly much run for the providers as much as the beneficiaries. Why? Because the providers are the ones that get together and have a bigger influence on the reelectability of the elected officials. So that explains why the NRA, a single issue advocacy group, still keeps Congress from passing the most sensible things in the world, just background checks. Why the teachers unions are able to keep teachers who literally can't teach in front of a classroom and the kids are the ones that suffer. It explains why some of the programs we do for um, elderly people don't make any sense because the AARP doesn't want any change. But single issue advocacy groups like that really are what's driving the government because they're driving who gets reelected. And what we've got to do as people is try to find ways to get people elected who are willing to stand up and say, I want to do what's right. And even if I'm going to get grief for it, I'm going to do it. And I, in Massachusetts, I got involved through, I think it was Alice Walton, with uh, your governor and helped him on a campaign which turned out didn't work, uh, but to expand the number of charter schools across the state. And I thought for your governor to take that position was a really courageous thing. Now, I don't know very much about what else he's done, but just looking at him that way, there was a good example of somebody who took a political risk to try to do what was right, and I hope the public likes him. Is he popular? I, I think he should be. I don't know. I haven't followed your politics. He is. Your business, Bloomberg LLC, is not just a leader in financial information and financial news, but really the dominant force in financial data. And how, how do you keep innovation going in a company that is so dominant in the space in which it operates? Well, I think you have to understand first who you are. We are a high margin, low volume business that caters to a small group of professionals, they happen to be financial professionals, um, who need high quality information very accurately delivered around the world, very rapidly and all that. And the fact that we've been successful does not mean that we could be successful in other businesses and uh, other areas. And I think people always think, oh, I can run one business, therefore I can run all businesses. I don't think that's true, partially because the skills are different for each industry and each business, and partly because an awful lot of success is really due to luck, and nobody's willing to admit that, and the likelihood of you being lucky twice isn't all that great. So um, first thing is knowing who you are and what you're good at. And the second thing, if I had to pick another one, I'd say you've got to try to anticipate what the market wants. Um, asking your sales force and your customers what they want you have to listen to your customers, but they're very good at doing what they do. They're not necessarily very good at anticipating what's going to be there tomorrow. As a matter of fact, there's a book, if you want to read one book on business, I would read a book by a Boston guy, uh, Clay Christensen, who's a professor at the Harvard Business School. He wrote a book called The Innovator's Dilemma. And the gist of the book is things are going well but you see something coming down the road that tells you it's going to change and you're going to be roadkill unless you do something, and you still don't do, some, do anything. Why? Because your employees are happy, your customers are happy, you're happy, the stockholders are happy, and nobody's willing to change. And change is scary. Change could cost you your job. Change could cost you your uh, vacation. Change could cost you your friends and your family. And so people are unwilling to do that. But I think if you want to be a successful company, you do that. What we try to do, and I don't want to overstate it because if Fidelity is a big customer, thank you. Uh, if Fidelity asks for something, we certainly do it. But what we try to do is to think, what will Fidelity want down the road, build it, 
and then come and show it to you and try to convince you to buy it. Now, sometimes it's a, we went down the wrong path. You don't want it, nobody wants it. But that's just the cost of doing business. But at least sometimes we're gonna have something our competitors don't have, and that's the next generation. And I thought Jeff Bezos said it very well. Somebody was asking him recently why he's been so successful with Amazon, and the example they asked about was the cloud. And Amazon is the biggest player in the crowd cloud business where they store data for, and share the data with lots of people. Um, not IBM, not Oracle, but it's a company like Amazon. And Jeff was asked, how did he get ahead? And he said, he started it, nobody paid any attention. They had two years before anybody realized that there was a business out there. And by that time, first mover advantage had got him so far ahead, it was really hard to catch up. Now, he's not going to own the world, but he is going to own a big part of it. And I think that's what companies have to do. You want an example of the other direction, Eastman Kodak. They certainly saw cell phones with cameras in them, and yet, and maybe they couldn't have done anything, I don't know, but they certainly didn't try to do anything. They stayed in the film business, and overnight, one of the iconic biggest companies in America literally went out of business. So your business is increasingly becoming technology-centric. And technology is a big part of, I think, some of the offerings that you have in mind for your customers in the future. How do you compete for technology talent? And there's a lot of companies out there. Uh, they may be based here on the East Coast. They may be based on the West Coast. Uh, there's not enough real technology talent in the country right now to go around. How are, you, how are you waging war in that battle? Well, I don't want to overstate it, but the kind of engineer, or used to be called programmers, now they're called engineers, that uh, we would hire were winning competitions in the sixth grade. They weren't people that late in life somebody taught them how to code. You can do that, but the kind of the level of sophistication of our technology and where we use technology is way over that. We recruit, and actually we do pretty well. We compete with Amazon and Google, Facebook, Microsoft, a couple of others. And we, do, we, get, we get more than our share, but only marginally more than our share. But the, the way I would attract, try to attract you is I'd say, look, Abigail, if you go to work for them, you're making a bunch of people that are wealthy, wealthier. Come to Bloomberg, all of the company's profits go to the Bloomberg Foundation and we give it away. We're curing cancer and we're doing this and we're doing that. And number two, if you come to us, you're not a small a cog and a very big wheel. We give you real responsibility. You can measure your progress. We're using the most advanced technologies. We're doing everything that anybody else is. But it's also a, a fun place to work. We are very philanthropic, but we're also the people in the company get involved in the local communities and that sort of thing. And that's a with climate change I mentioned before, that's attractive, not to everybody, but to some people. And I think it's one of the reasons we do well. And we have very low turnover. And people talk. They know when you work for a company, whether it was good or bad, you were promised something and then, yeah, they gave you the ability to wash a laundry at work, but they didn't give you any real responsibility. And I'd like to think that Bloomberg does. Now, we sometimes make mistakes in who we hire or how we treat people or whatever. Uh, but we've done very well in, in, in terms of attracting new people and keeping them happy and producing products by focusing on the people. I think the mistake everybody makes or more and more is they think that because we have all this digital stuff, it's a digital world. And I do not accept that. I think it's an analog world more than ever before. The more stuff gets automated, the more our people are important because the automation is something that everybody will get. No offense intended, but what we sell to you, we sell to your competitors. Or what you can build in technology, your competitors can build. Your advantage is your people, and that's the same thing for us. And so the care and feeding of our people is what my real job is. And um, that's the ways we distinguish ourselves. I need to remember you have beautiful surroundings and free food in your offices as well. Do you, do you look mostly on campuses? Do you look for people from other industries, from, from the military, public service? Well, uh, we have programs that target certain groups. Um, 
the percentage of women in engineering is abysmally low and in computer science lower than that. So we have certainly outreach programs to try to attract uh, women who to go into those careers and then to come to us. The trouble, of course, is everybody else wants the same people, so there's a lot of competition for them. Um, we try to do, th we have programs to uh, uh, military people leaving after serving this country, uh, and it's reasonably successful. We started a program to work with um, former uh, criminals who in were incarcerated. Um, you know, the number of jobs that they can do in our company because they didn't have a long time experience as engineers is limited. But we do try to reach out to, to different groups. Um, and we are very diverse. Um, make sure we try to understand everybody's culture to the extent possible and um, give them the kind of environment that they're comfortable with. And one of the things that's hurting us, uh, both in the United States and in the UK, is we have employees, not a lot, but some who are starting to say, I don't want to work here. Can we transfer to someplace else? This country doesn't like immigrants. And all of this talk in Washington, words have consequences. And whether we change the immigration laws or not, there's a general feeling around the world that America is no longer an open, welcoming place, and a lot of people don't want to go there. And the same thing is happening in the UK because of Brexit. So thinking about your business, your experience in public service, your activities in philanthropy, what are, what are the common themes that, that run through all of those things? Well, it's sort of, I, I suppose, because it's a private company and I give all of, I own 86% of the company and that 86% of the profits go to the foundation and you know, I have a personal life that's been helpful, I think, to the business. It's sort of all the Bloomberg family is sort of pushed together. Uh, when I die, the foundation gets the company and they'll have to sell it at that point because the law doesn't let you really have a private foundation run a company. But we've been able to, because we've made a lot of money, use the money to make a difference. Because we try to go out and be philanthropic, it helps us attract people to the company. It's all sort of all pulled together. And I'm very proud of my two daughters who I will not allow them to work in the company. I'm uh, different than your company. We don't allow family members to work there. Uh, <laughs> but yours has worked out okay. You've done a spectacular job. Your parents are very proud. Um, but my two daughters, the one thing I did do for them, uh, they sign every gift uh, agreement that we have. So I hopefully after I'm gone, they'll still get invited to dinner parties. But Speaking of Brexit, do you have any recommendations for our friends in the UK on, on how they might move forward and get themselves out of this mess they've well, got themselves into? It's, it is really hard to understand why a country that was doing so well wanted to ruin it. If you think about things that they talk about, immigration, the UK didn't take anybody from Northern Africa or from the Middle East. The UK immigrants came from places like Poland where they needed carpenters and painters and plumbers and that sort of thing. So they didn't have an immigration problem. Being in control of their borders, they had the English Channel. That gave them control of their borders. Then they complained about all the regulations. Well, Boris Johnson wrote a piece, totally fictitious, when he was a, a, a journalist assigned to Brussels. And he said, well, if you were importing bananas to the EU, it had to be four bananas in a bunch. That was a law made by bureaucrats in Brussels. Well, number one, it was fictitious. They don't have any laws like that. And number two, the last time I saw the uh, England grow bananas and send them to the EU was a very long time ago. So, you know, there's a, but a lot of those things, um, it, it was not a smart thing to do. And getting out of it is going to be very difficult and it'll be very painful. Um, it will hurt industries. People are already taking space in other cities over there, us included. Um, we're opening a brand new European headquarters in London, two big, expensive buildings. Um, would I have done it if I'd known they were going to drop out? I'd, ha I'd have some thoughts about that. Maybe I wouldn't have. 
uh, but we're there and we're going to be very happy. And my former wife was a Brit. My daughters have British passports. So, you know, we love England. It was the father of our, of our country, I suppose. But what they're doing is not good and there's no easy ways to get out of it because if they don't pay a penalty, everybody else would drop out anyway as, as in addition. So they can't get as good a deal as they had before. And in my view, the old deal was better than anything else. So why would you want to do it? Um, now, whether or not I, I did say that uh, uh, I thought it was the single stupidest thing any country's ever done, but then we trumped it. <laughs> I think they can maybe continue to just kick the can down and the road well, and maybe, maybe it never actually no, happens. No, eventually they have to have a deal and uh, uh, either they go back to the old the WTO uh, system where there are tariffs and they have to negotiate and that sort of thing. But what they're losing is London was the center of Europe and that's not going to be as true anymore. It's still a wonderful city. If you want to live in a European city, particularly, you want something that's English friendly and fa English speaking and family friendly and all that sort of thing, cosmopolitan. And uh, London has that, and the UK has a wonderful history that our, all of our freedoms came from. Uh, but nevertheless, they really had uh, their game going, and this has slowed them down. And uh, I think. What happened there is what actually happened here. Um, I want to be careful how I say it, but I think uh, many of us, particularly in America on the coast, um, forgot that there was a big part of this country who was suffering and had uh, values and fears that we didn't try to take uh, into uh, accommodate. And uh, you see that in an election here, which you know, nobody thought Donald Trump would, was going to get elected, but uh, nobody ever took a look at people in the Midwest and uh, looked at the family where the next job, if they get fired, is going to be flipping hamburgers and they can't feed their family on flipping hamburgers. And people are really worried about their jobs. They read about technology and they see industries come and go. Um, and you've got to, we've got to, they see our social values changing. Our kids are doing different things than we did. And, Parents have trouble adjusting to that, particularly if you don't live in a cosmopolitan place like Boston or New York or LA, San Francisco. Um, and so you see the Trump phenomenon, you see Brexit coming out of that, you see Macron, who I think will be very good for France, but a, a guy who was an independent third party candidate and he got elected and is trying to shake things up. Merkel doesn't have the um, power that she had before. Italy doesn't really have a leader. Spain doesn't have a leader. You know, the whole world is changing, and part of it is because of social media, part of it is because of um, people losing their jobs, but a lot of it is an arrogance on the part of all of us that we know what is right. And there's nothing wrong with knowing what's right and changing, but you've got to have the patience and the understanding to go and sell it to people and explain to them and convince them why it's right. You can't just force it down their throats. And I think that for the last couple of decades, the intelligentsia has been doing exactly that. So one core thing that plays an important role in shaping all of these events and how they, they come to happen and how they get resolved or, or not is journalism. And I'm curious about what your thoughts are on the state of journalism today. I understand your organization has been continuing to invest in your news content, and that's not what many other news outlets are doing. How, how do you see the future of journalism? Well, we used to have a fourth estate that was profitable, it sold ads and it sold subscriptions, and the monies were sufficient to focus on trying to explain things to the world. It was a profit motive, but it wasn't the first thing. Most journalists don't go into journalism to make money, and the owners of most uh, news outlets didn't really focus on that either. 
What has changed is the advertising has gone to the internet, so all of a sudden they're worried about their jobs, they're even worried about their companies surviving, and so instead of having the altruistic intent of explaining to the public and trying to do what's right, or they are looking for eyeballs and clicks, and they get more and more sensationalist, and the public unfortunately really does like scandal and failure and embarrassment and all of that sort of stuff, violence. Um, and so I, was, I said to the New York Times publisher a few weeks ago, he helped get Donald Trump elected. Why? Because he had Donald Trump on the right-hand column of the front page of the New York Times virtually every single day. And Arthur Salzberger said, well, we had to explain to the public what he was saying and why it was wrong or right or whatever. And I said, number one, Arthur, you didn't have to do it on the front page every day. And number two, just giving somebody that kind of publicity. Donald Trump got elected without really spending any money of his own at all or raising any amount of money at all. He got free publicity because the news business today is so focused on des they're desperate, to, whether it's in print or over the internet, um, to, to get enough eyeballs and clicks that they can stay in business. And the sensationalist press comes out of that, uh, a press that's so focused on one philosophy comes out of that. So, you know, CNN had Trump on all the time, Fox, uh, the same thing, MSNBC, did, hey, they had Trump on all the time too. They just had a different philosophy of going against him rather than for him. But there's this old adage that there's no bad publicity as long as they spell your name right. And Trump, I, he was either smart or just an accident, but whatever, that's what he benefited from, whether you like him or dislike him. And I'm not trying to to, to criticize him, but he got elected because he did something nobody else was willing to do, violate the Marcus of Queensbury rules, say things that were outrageous and controversial, and the press just took it and spoon-fed it to the rest of us. They thought they were couching it in the 37th paragraph to say that it wasn't true or whatever, but the bottom line is nobody gets that far. We, we've grown to a world where 140 characters is how we get our news, and nobody gets onto the 141st character. Uh, and the press is continuing to go in that direction. Um, it's not clear how this all plays out, but the public thinks Oliver Stone is a historian, and the public doesn't, we don't teach civics anymore in schools. Um, somebody did, I love the um, poll they did, they asked what year was 9-11, did 9-11 take place in? and less than 50% could answer that question. And then after a few other questions, they came back and they said, what month was 9-11 in? And the results weren't any better. So, I mean, we can blame ourselves when our school systems are getting worse. We used to be in the top 10 worldwide, now we're barely in the top 50. What do you think happens if you don't educate your kids? You're not gonna have educated voters and the people that wanna get elected aren't going to push policies that require explanation and sacrifice to them. And, you know, JFK asked not what you can do, what we can do for you, what you can do for your country. Those thoughts don't occur to anybody anymore, or a lot less than they did before. We may pay a little bit of lip service to it, but uh, I'm really very worried about the direction we're going, and I think the fourth estate has contributed to this, and uh, I'm sympathetic that they have to stay in business. Uh, Bloomberg News, we have 2,500 reporters, but it's all part of our bigger product. It's not a news organization that has to stand alone, and we focus on business news and financial news, so it's not all the general news. Now, there'll still be some great newspapers, and there'll still be decent radio and TV stations, uh, but uh, we've dumbed down the level of the discourse and the sophistication of what we're trying to do. I did enter uh, a lot of read. I did enter climate of hope into the search field of my terminal, and I got quite a bit of investment in financial news back. So climate of hope is the book that you wrote about climate change. You've talked a lot about climate change in your comments already. But tell us what, what do you what makes you hopeful? 
and how can we all have hope about the future? Well, climate, climate change, change has the potential to kill every living thing on the world, on the planet, and make it like Mars. Um, climate change is taking place. Nobody knows how fast it's going. Nobody knows whether we will get or have already passed a tipping point. But it is a real risk, and you can see it every day. If the storms that took out the Caribbean and Puerto Rico and Florida and Texas and the fires in California don't get you to say, or, or look in the Rocky Mountains where there are these miles and miles of dead trees because the, ocean, the, the winters aren't cold enough to kill the beetles anymore and they're killing trees. If that stuff doesn't get you worried, I don't know what would. That's the bad side. The good side is that there are things you can do. And those things are not all that hard. Uh, we can convince government to do things if we call up and say, do this or I'm not going to vote for you or I'm going to vote for your opponent, get my friends to vote for your opponent. Political power advocacy is, is really important. Uh, as I said before, we can use less energy in our own lives. Um, we can picket power plants to have them close the coal-fired power plants, which are the worst polluters in, in the world by far. Um, so there are things there, and, and we tried to, in the book, outline what the problems were, but also how there were individual solutions. Is it enough to stop the process of the oceans getting warmer, which will mean more storms and more violent storms and more floods and droughts and all of that sort of stuff? Nobody knows. But it's the interesting thing about climate is if you pollute, everybody around the world suffers. If you reduce your pollution, everybody around the world benefits. And so when somebody says, oh, well, we're not gonna stop pollution until they stop polluting, it doesn't make any sense at all. It'd be nice if they stopped as well, but you can still do something by your own actions. And so we tried to phrase, uh, the book is about what you can do. And the other author of the book, Carl Pope, who uh, worked at the Sierra Club, he was really the genius behind the book. It should have been uh, Pope Bloomberg rather than Bloomberg Pope. But, um, and then he had a play on the religious thing, but that's, my mother, my mother always wanted me to be more religious, but I don't think that's what she had in mind. Uh, uh, but, but there are, uh, he, he ran the Sierra Club, and the Sierra Club, which we've given them, I just announced the other day on the $64 million, um, in addition to the $100 million we've spent already, to uh, give them the wherewithal to get people together to continue the closing of the power plants. And to show you the uh, ineffectiveness of the federal government, we've closed as many power plants since Donald Trump, or we've closed power plants at the same rate since Donald Trump got elected as we did before that. So uh, the, the, it's our individual decisions these power plants made by people who are either worried about what the public thinks uh, about their pollution or their own families say to them, I don't want to live downstream to what you're putting in the air, or the economics. And the good news is fracked natural gas is a lot cheaper than coal, dramatically cheaper, and not perfect as a fuel, but much better. But the real change is the renewables, solar and wind and hydro, is so cheap now that nobody's going to stop this. There are big utilities that are think, planning on going all renewable. And just think about what that means. Now they need better batteries to generate power in the day and distribute it at night and those kinds of things. But the technology in those things are changing dramatically. In Texas, where the, environment, uh, the energy secretary comes from Texas or the EPA comes from Texas, one from Oklahoma, one from Texas, I forget which. Oklahoma is the biggest wind generator and Texas, the renewables uh, are generating electricity at one third the price of coal. And all of, in Texas, two places where the governors were, to say they weren't helpful is the most biggest understatement I've ever made. Those two are two of the states that are leading. So we are getting there, there is, there is hope. You've talked about education and uh, implied a lot about how it relates to economic mobility. When it comes to cities, particularly very high cost of living cities like Boston and New York, what more can these cities be doing to help people get into jobs that will really give them the economic mobility to be able to live and, and thrive and stay in these cities? Well, the, uh, my successor said that um, New York was a city that nobody could afford to live there. 
Um, my recollection from Adam Smith's my first economics class was um, it's exactly the reverse. Too many people can afford to live there. That's why there are no empty apartments. That's why there's no empty seats in the schools or too much traffic. Um, so to some extent, there's a selection process that's taking place in Boston. The reason it's hard to get a job and to live here if you're at the lower end of the economic ladder is there's so many other people who want to live here. And if you, you could argue that if you let capitalism be the main dis, 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 um, uh, allocator of capital and of people, uh, that's very healthy. Now, in New York, and I think Boston too, we want to have housing for people who are taking jobs where we need them and we need them to do those jobs, but they don't pay enough so that they can't compete at the higher end. They're not going to live on Beacon Hill. So you have to find other places where they can live. That generally means also providing mass transit so that if they can live a little further out where you can afford to build housing, they can still get to work. And you have to have decent schools for them so they can work their ways up the economic ladder. There's no one problem here. Uh, but I think the answer is training, um, high schools, uh, elementary schools. If, if you if a child falls behind in elementary school, they're probably never going to catch up for the rest of their life. There are some examples of kids catching up, but it is so hard. Uh, in New York, we used to promote the kids every year um, because the teachers couldn't teach them. They couldn't learn. So how do you get rid of the kid? You promote them to the next grade, where the kid is even further behind. And we called it social promotion, and one, it was one of the things we ended. But it was a disaster for these kids. But somehow or other, come back to it, you've got to improve the schools, number one. You've got to, number two, assume that college is not the right thing for everyone. College is an aspiration that you should have, maybe, but, and, and people that go to college generally make more money than people that don't go to college. But if you have two children and one of your kids goes to Harvard next year and the other becomes a plumber's apprentice, the Harvard kid is never going to catch up to the plumber because the plumber has a job where you can't farm it out, there aren't enough of them, um, they're in charge of their own destiny, um, and so we've got to understand there are vocational trades where if you could train people for they could have a great life. And uh, we, back in the 60s, closed all the vocational schools across the country because the argument was, what do you mean my kid's not going to go to Harvard, Yale, or Princeton? Look, lady, a kid's in the 11th grade and he can't read. He's not going to go to Harvard, Yale, or Princeton, but we've got to find something that he can do. And one of the things we did, we joined with IBM, which was Sam Palmasano was really a leader in this. We created a program where there was a grade 13 and 14 in high school where we'd funded it and, and IBM helped, and then they offered them jobs if they did... Uh, it, were able to uh, uh, continue on up. And they weren't going to be at the top of IBM, but they would have real good jobs. So it's training people uh, to go into the workforce. The harder one is what do you do with people who are already out in the workforce? And that's very difficult because people look around the audience, virtually none of us are at the age where we could go, could go back to school. We just couldn't sit there and we don't learn that fast and all that sort of stuff. But you, there, it, one of the things my foundation's working on is trying to train coal miners in West Virginia because through no fault of their own, the jobs have disappeared. They're going to continue to disappear. They're not coming back. It's all, and it has nothing to do with climate change, incidentally. It's all automation. Today, you push a button, then you rip the top off the mountain, and then you destroy the environment, but you get the coal out with almost no people so that people that used to dig for coal no longer have jobs. But you can find jobs for them. There's demand for truckers, for example, although down the road, uh, automated uh, cars and trucks will maybe hurt them. But there's other things. They can become uh, installers of solar panels and wind. Um, and there are a lot of jobs where construction, where these are people who are used to working with their hands. Their bodies are tough enough to go into uh, construction, which an average office worker cannot. When people, politicians say, oh, infrastructure will be the solution to office workers losing their jobs, that's ridiculous. They're not going to be able to work in that environment, but coal miners could. The trouble with coal miners is, and true of people in the retail business across this country that are losing their jobs as stores close because of automation and price discovery and things like that, that those people basically can't move. They have a mortgage, 
the kids don't, they don't want to move in school, their health isn't good sometimes, particularly in mining country where everybody's been breathing all this crap in the air. And so it's a great challenge in how you find jobs for them. But nevertheless, you can. And there are some organizations in West Virginia which we're funding, and we're looking for others to try to do that. But that's another reason why the public is worried about the future, because jobs, once you're out of school, very hard to change your career. Mike, you've contemplated a run for president in the past. Is that under consideration for the future? And if not you, who and, and how do we find the next candidates? if they're not you. Well, I, I thought about running, and seriously, we'd made commercials, we had lawyers on retainer, everything. Yeah, but it didn't work, so let's not. What we found was, and we did an awful lot of polling, an independent has to get 50% of the electoral votes, or they have no chance, because if nobody has 50%, it goes to the House of Representatives to pick the president, and the Senate to pick the vice president. And it's really hard to see how you could get 50% of the votes as an independent because a third of the people are so tied into one party and a third of the other. I've always joked, but I don't think it's that far off from the truth. There's a third of the public who's Democrats. They would vote Democratic if Trump were the candidate, and there's a third of Republicans, and they would vote Republican even if Hillary were their candidate, no matter what they say. They just don't go off that. Then there's a third that has dropped out of these two parties leaving the two parties, incidentally, in the hands of the extremists. And so you can expect more extreme candidates coming from them. But even those in the middle, they basically divide half to the left, half to the right. And that's what you saw in the election. Trump won the electoral vote by a few. Hillary won the popular vote by a few. But fundamentally, the country was split down the middle. And there was no room for a third party candidate. That's what we concluded. And to run if you had no chance of winning just didn't make a lot of sense at all. Uh, you know, and I've got a good life. I'm happy in trying to change the world and learn to play golf and speak Spanish and do all the things. I've got two great kids and grandkids, and I have a good life. And, you know, you don't have to be president of the United States. Next time around, what's likely to happen? You don't know what's going to happen in the Republican Party. Trump, I don't know if he uh, continues on. I, I've always thought impeachment's not very likely. But he's controversial, and he pushes the, into r the realm that politicians have never gone before. I think it's a nice way to say it. And so uh, I assume he'll serve four years. I assume if he will go and run for re-election, and the incumbent has a odds-on chance, always, the incumbent has some real advantages. Don't know whether that's going to happen, but on the Republican side, that's the most likely scenario. Uh, and on the Democratic side, it's got to be 25 people who think they're going to run and, and be president. And at the beginning, there'll be 25, and then it'll be whittled down pretty quickly because some of them won't be able to attract any money or any uh, interest from the press and uh, you'll get down to a, a Donnie Brook on the Democratic side. But what's happened in these parties, and you saw it, Hillary was pulled way to the left, walked away from the trade pack that was, we desperately needed to create jobs for the people in America, this TPP, which was designed to freeze out China and give all of the advantages to America, and that we walked away from, and now China's picking up all of that. Why did she, she wrote the legislation. Why did she walk away from it? Because the Democratic Party was moving further to the left with Sanders and Warren and that sort of thing. And the Democrat, the Republican Party is the same problem, only in the other direction. You have Bannon, who says he's going to run a candidate against everyone who the, most of us in this room would think are very, very conservative. They're not conservative enough for him. So the, the parties are in flux. You have social media, which for the first time lets you get messages out without explanation, without any attribution in a way as you never could before. Um, you know, Trump got elected because of social media. Maybe a little help from the Russians, but who knows. Um, but, but I think it's going to be a big dynamic. It's really hard to predict who would come out and, you know, who's going to run. I, it's three years away, so anybody that says they're going to run now, you're just wasting your time. What you should focus on is trying to get elected those people who you would like to have in Congress and in the Senate in an election that's going to take place some, uh, 12 and a half months from now, and then people are going to start to focus on the next thing.
Okay, last question. With all of the things that we've talked about, thinking across all of the things that impact you, that are elements in your life, what keeps you going? What keeps you optimistic and wanting to stay really aggressive and active in so many different things? I hadn't thought about this. I, I was at a dinner party recently where somebody tried to get a conversation going around the table of what was the worst job you ever had? And um, I've never had a bad job. Um, when I was here in high school, I always worked. I wrote letters to different uh, electronic companies and had summer jobs and then I had a job all through college and uh, then I went to work at Solomon Brothers and got fired 15 years later but it was a wonderful experience of great people they did me a favor including firing me was the greatest thing that ever happened to me if it happens to you you should say thank you um, and then I started my own company and then 12 years in City Hall and I've always looked forward to going into work every day I've always believed that tomorrow is going to be the, uh, the best day of my life. And, you know, there are times when things don't go well and times you'd like to slam your fist into a light pole. But if you and your family have their health and, you know, we still have a democracy, it's kind of hard not to look, look forward. And, and I am worried very much about our government. I'm worried about the, our, our students. I'm worried about uh, this... Uh, Willing, this unwillingness to let people express themselves on college campuses, which is a disgrace, uh, unwillingness to teach in schools issues of both liberal and conservative values and to let people decide after they have some knowledge. Uh, I'm really worried about our intolerance. Uh, I think this country's um, less integrated in many ways than it was a dozen years ago. Uh, but still, if you're going to vote with your feet and go to a country, you, people want to come to America, and there's a good reason. We still are the greatest country in the world. The danger is we can lose it, and there are plenty of other good places to live, plenty of other people with other values, and they might, may not be our values, but there are lots of people that like those values, and there are some countries like China whose just uh, growing leaps and bounds, and I would not want to live there. I like our system of government and our values, but they're going to be a big competitor on the world stage. Um, you've got the nuclear power, uh, nuclear bombs, let other people be uh, major players, and it's a dangerous world. But I still get up every day and answer your question, and I, I look forward to it, and I like to be overscheduled and run around and do 10 things and get into bed and instantly fall asleep and get up the next morning. It's a good, good time. Mike, thank you for being here today. Thank Thanks you, for everybody. coming to see us. Mm -hmm.